Hello, I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And welcome to our Come Follow Me. And we'll do this time episode 13, which is Exodus 1 through 6. Before we go any farther, just remember to click the like and subscribe to help us out and keep these things going. And we're going to make a little change. Yeah, it's going to be just a little different. What we want to do is we just want to break the two episodes in half. So you can watch one for the one week and one for the next, even though we're still going to kind of record them at the same time. What that really translates to you is we're going to cover every week, but we're going to do it smaller pieces. Anyway. Yay. Yay. Ho, ho. <laughs> I am that I am. That's the, t- the the name we've given this session. It's obviously episode 13, Exodus 1 through 6. But I, I feel like this portion, the I am, is probably some of the most significant part of this portion of Exodus, even though the, it's hard to put one over another. Anyway, that being said... Jesus is going to refer back to it again and again and again. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to show that. But before I get started too far, I just wanted to say, hey, yeah. To you, because if you say, hey, ya, now you have the Hebrew pronunciation for I am. So when you're in that mood to just have a pick-me-up, just declare to this eternities, hey, ya. Hey, ya. I am. I am. It's kind of let's fun. Do it. <laughs> let's do this thing. Anyway, so first off, let's just introduce Moses in the Hebrew. Um, the idea that the mim shin hey, the name for Moses in the Hebrew being Moshe, um, spoken. It, it's a really cool idea that in, in the Blue Letter Bible that actually refers to that having a meaning of drawn, that he's drawn from the water. And you'll see later that that becomes a type of Moses, what his mission is a little, that he draws Israel from the water. I'm going to actually go there a little more in a minute. So waters destroy the breath. So not only did the Red Sea um, save the Israelites, and they were drawn from the Red Sea in the birth of their nation, but it also... It destroyed the breath of the Egyptians, you know. So we have, it's really interesting in Hebrew that every word almost has a uh, opposition in all things meaning, where it has the yin and the yang. Yeah, in, in Isaiah, we call this a, a reversal. It is, it is like, we, and we've said this before, at the crossing of the Red Sea, was it a good day or a bad day? It exactly. depends if you are Egyptian or Israelite, right? So um, it what is bad for one is good for the other and vice versa. Yeah. And so really, it's so fascinating to me that in the Hebrew that, that it does this. It's like there's so much depth. And don't think for a minute that my descriptions of meaning are... Limiting. Limiting. Yeah. I don't want to put that this is absolute what it means because I think the meaning has depth. And when you're working with pictures, there's so many <clears throat> levels that you can exactly. read it. Yeah. It's like scripture in an essence. It has yeah. so much depth. So I'm going to also say that it's the breath that separates from the waters. In other words, we said the water destroys the breath. That's the Egyptian side. But the breath that separates the water, the east wind that separated the Red Sea, actually gave them their path to become a nation right. in power. And that's I think it's just really cool. And when you look at the Hebrew pronunciation, Moshe, and you think of a museum in Ohio that has the the holy stone in it that has right. Moshe on it, you realize that it absolutely is the Hebrew and it's the way it's said that's on the on the holy stones. Let's not even try it. Yeah. We'll just say it. Okay. Uh, but anyway, the museum that has it there, and we've been there, and it's really awesome. Rewrite those words. Ohio. Um when the, this is where the holy stone is. <clears throat> okay, that being said, Moses being a type of Israel drawn from the waters of the Red Sea on the seventh day. That's important when you get to know Daniel's numbers. When you begin to understand that Israel became, I mean, it sort of became a na- nation on Passover when they were let my people go, but then it really became defined as a nation when they no more had oppressors on their hills. And that was accomplished on the seventh day, on the day seventh day of unleavened bread, when the Red Sea was parted. It's really, really awesome when you think about that. So this word in Exodus 3, 14 through 15, or the, this, and I say word because I am is one word in the Hebrew. It's not two words like we would do it. It's one single meaning, and it's virtually taken right from the name of Jehovah, the I am. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. 
And he said, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. That is just kind of a little bit of a reaching thought. What is I am? What does that mean? We're going to go there a little bit. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God. Now, when it's that in the Hebrew, it's not just the word Elohim or Yehovah. It's actually both words in sequence. So it's Yehovah Elohim, which basically means he's defining what part of Elohim he is. Okay, he's Jehovah. He is the redeemer of Elohim portion. He is that part of the gods that are one God. Now, I'm going to get there with that so you don't get confused. Because there's this big debate between Mormondom and Christianity. Is there many gods or are there one God? Right. Uh, and that's been a big issue between Mormondom and I'm not supposed to use that word anymore, forgive me for that, but between us of the Restoration and the mainstream Christians is the idea of, are there many gods or one god? And so... Polytheism or yeah, monotheism. Yeah, and so the answer is, like almost every time, the answer is in the understanding of the... Con what's, of the... I'm having a mind moment. Construct. She says construct of the contradiction. Oh. Okay. That in the jewel is in the in the resolution of the contradiction because even the Jews believe that God is one God. Okay. So it's a little complicated when we get the restoration and Joseph Smith talking about many gods. But you begin to understand it's not in conflict. And I'm hoping to develop that thought really clearly here in the next few um, slides and then this presentation farther that you can see that the truth is both and I'll, I'll get there in a minute anyway so God said moreover unto Moses thou shalt say unto the children of Israel the Lord God Jehovah Elohim of your fathers the God Elohim of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob all being Elohim what that's saying is he's clarifying who's talking of it to me of it's almost Elohim. like one God, two God, and three God, or... Well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to resolve that even though they are three, they are one. So, uh, one aspect of one God, one aspect of that same, another aspect of the same God, and the third aspect of that God. Father, Son, right, Holy okay. Ghost. You know, and so in essence, when we say, we in Article of Faith number one, we say, we believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Are we saying we believe that there's three gods or one God? And the answer is, they are God. The they are God. That's what it means, in essence. Okay, so now let's go right to the Hebrew word, I am. Hey, yod, hey. The hey, -ah. Like I said earlier, hey, -ah is the pronunciation. So when he says that, realize that throughout Scripture, you're going to see the words, I am, all over the Old Testament and all over Scripture. But this one's spelled different in the Hebrew. Translated the, diff the same, I am, but it's, although they do capitalize it, but it's, di it's actually different spelling. The, uh, the word is actually spelled differently in the Hebrew from a regular I am to this I am. Because this I am refers to I exist, I have existed. It's like truth. It's the truth in the past, the now, and the future. That's the definition of truth. The alpha mim tav. Aleph. Aleph. Yeah, sorry about that. Aleph mim tav, which is the word truth, which means the the beginning, the middle, and the end, or or the things past. Is, in, the, in the Doctrine and Covenants, things as they are, things as they were, and, and as things they as they be. are to come. So it's really, him by saying, I am, he's expressing that I am all of that. I'm, I'm, I am, I exist, I am God. Was, is, to come. It's definition of truth. He's actually saying, I am truth. So that meaning, behold the work of the word, the breath. 
behold the the work of the breath. It's really beautiful when you think about these definitions. Revealing, making the breath. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. He's the Holy Spirit. And yet, in this instance, he's telling which part of that he is that's speaking. Yehovah Elohim. Or that's that's defining the position that's speaking unto us. That hey Yah has a chiastic nature of uh, the I am. It has a hey yod hey. So it's it's mirroring itself through the middle. It's chiastic in its nature and it implies eternal. I exist. I'm eternal. A repeating pattern was, is, will be. It's really kind of cool when you think about it. That he's actually <laughs> and I I distracted this last week and I watched I've been watching different things and trying to learn different things about the the pictorial Hebrew and there was this one guy that come in and lambasted everybody trying to do pictorial Hebrew. He's basically saying, ah, you're all up in the night. That's not fact. Of course, he didn't back up anything he said. He just used the word fact. This isn't true. And I thought reminded me of mainstream media. Um, <laughs> when you when you get into this stuff, you know they just slam this out here. Fact. This isn't true. And yet when you go research it. Guess what? It's true. You know? <laughs> and that seems to be the nature of that video I watched. I was kind of like, wow. Because you say it's fact, I'm supposed to believe it. And that's kind of the whole thesis of the whole spirit of Antichrist. You know, just believe me. Because I, I, I said it. And so they say it a lot so that you do believe them. Now I want to just go into John. And I want to define this I am from Christ's day in his perspective. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And so he, right there, is flying so in the face of their traditions. Well, especially when you consider the fact that Moses came after Abraham. And then now he's using that I am God statement that we get from Exodus chapter 3, and we're flipping it all the way back before Abraham. And he's claiming it personally. Yeah. That is pretty amazing. So what he's really saying is, hey, guess what, guys? And I'm, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to let Scripture say it, because I, I, I we totally believe that our opinion doesn't matter. So I'm going to let Scripture say it here in a minute, where he actually says, I am he. Anyway, and if you've got any questions about how the Pharisees took it and the Jews took it at the time, all you got to do is look at what they did. Yes. They, they thought, you blasphemous soul, you are claiming to be God. Well, they did what was required by the law for anyone who, who blasphemed. blasphemed against God that they would and be so, stoned. That's so they like took it. up stones to cast upon him and Jesus hid himself. So they recognized the claim he was making right there in John 8. If you had any doubts how they took it, they uh, they in the day that it happened took it that he was blaspheming and they took up stones. And claiming to be God. And then he used the force to hide himself. I, I, I'd laugh at that because, you know, think about it. Here he is in the midst of the temple. He makes his statement and gets them all ticked off at him and then he hides himself and goes out of the temple and I you know I I'm not trying to make light of it but but you know it's kind of like somehow he just cloaked their minds that's all I can see you know which is kind of cool you know and if you want to watch a great movie just look at the scriptures it's the greatest story he's ever told in so many ways um, the scriptures are full of just fun and excitement and and too often we, I, I have to appreciate The Chosen. I'm wearing the shirt today again. I have to appreciate the movie or the series, The Chosen, because it brings life to the life of Christ in a way that you don't see hardly anywhere. That And some people are offended by that because they feel like it makes Christ so human. I'm actually excited for it because it, it's like my daughter, when she introduced it to me, she says, it makes him so reachable, so tangible, not not in a way that you can't connect with. Anyway, so these I am statements that are made, 
Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. He's using these phrases to connect the dots. Back to Moses. Back to Moses. the burning bush. Yeah, he's, he's, he's making some pretty bold claims here. And sometimes we, we don't visualize the claims he's making. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will, you will know that I am. Wow. And you know, when you think of the I am, the, the hey, yo, hey, you're really seeing him on a cross twice with the hand in between. I mean, that's what the, that's what the yo, or the hey is, is a man raising his hands unto heaven. It is almost an image of him on the cross. Um, the yod hey, or excuse me, hey, yod hey. Um, so when you think about it, it's pretty exciting that you know that I am is referring to who he really is. Before Abraham, I was born, I am. So it's really cool. Um, as we go down through this, I just want you to understand how beautiful these things stack up. The most important of God's name, the four-letter name represented by the yod heh vav He, which if you understand that, and I'm going to hit it again, so I'm not going to hit it right now. I'm just going to move on. I am an utterance of the name of God. So I'm going to go to Abednai in the Book of Mormon so that you just understand the power of what he's stating in John. And now Abinadi said unto them, I would that you should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God, and having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. This kind of gets confusing until you start to connect the dots. The Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son. And they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. There again, the Christians would almost agree with the fact that it's one God. And yet, we would say, well, there's God's many, Joseph Smith taught us. So how do you reconcile these two concepts of being one God, and yet God many? It's a very fascinating concept to dwell into. And that God himself would come down and redeem us. Now, in the next few verses there in Moesiah, and thus the flesh becoming subject to the Spirit and the Son to the Father, being one God. So what he's really saying is this oneness isn't really um, one entity, one body, but it's a oneness of focus and purpose. That is what the word Elohim reflects. It is a group of individual beings like us who have become perfectly one, as the scriptures tell us we have to be, in, in their purpose, in their focus, in their goals and accomplishment. Jesus actually prays that in the intercessory prayer. We're going to get there. Prayer. Oh, you got the intercessory uh, Actually, I'm prayer. going there. Okay. So I'm going to quote it direct out. And he suffereth temptation and yieldeth not to temptation, but suffered himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. And after all this, after working many miracles among the children of men, he shall be led, yea, even as Isaiah said, as a sheep before the shearer is dumb, so that he opened not his mouth. Yea, even so that he is led, crucified, and slain, the flesh becoming subject even unto death, and the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father. What that's basically saying is that as we yield to the promises of the Holy Spirit, we are becoming one with the gods. <laughs> This is the whole thing that bothers the Christian world. Now, once again, I just want to just hit this Hebrew word that is Yehovah, yod Hey vav Hey. If you read it from a, a Western thinking, it is, behold the hand, behold the nail. It's saying right in his name, his whole mission and purpose is to redeem. When you start to actually try and wrap your head around this, you know, it, can a prophecy of the death of Christ be embedded in his name from before the foundation of the world? Can, can Moses actually be told exactly what Pharaoh is going to do and say before it happens? Can 
can even Abraham have a covenant with God and see the whole captivity of Egypt, 400 years and of, of bondage in Egypt, and all of this before it actually happens. Quite honestly, you have to ask yourself, do I believe in prophecy? I love it. Do I believe that it's real and that... Can he really see the end from Isaiah the beginning? Back to Isaiah 46, yes. God told the end from the beginning using types and shadows of and pictures. I it, believe it's, it's because like it's the also picture. cyclical in nature. Creation yeah. is cyclical. It's There's many layers to it. But, I mean, when you really wrap your head around... The, when you really wrap your head around the number of prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled over 600 prophecies and the impossibility of someone outside or some, someone inside of time to do these things. we You have to realize and accept that God is outside of time in order to... Another even, beautiful concept. We don't have to time do to, these to things. expand on. I, 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 love. Just, I just want to pause and think about what's in his name. I know, prophecy. it's really cool. And I would love to take time to actually go into how at the burning bush, he actually describes the events that are going to take place in front of Pharaoh later. But I frankly know that we get carried away and we take way too long. So I'm going to, I'm going to move on to keep the flow going to John, which was, he referred to earlier. And now, Oh father, this is the intercessory prayer that's spoken in the garden of Gethsemane that Christ is praying to the father, um, before he suffers for our sins. And he's pleading with the Father for them and then fulfills it. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So he's saying, you know, restore me to my glory. And they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. There is the clarification of God, that God is one. And yet God is many. And, and that glory that he's talking about is, is, is kind of asking God for strength to do what he needs to do. And just like when he... It's also the purpose. Right after the triumphal entry, when he rode up into Jerusalem and everything, we have in the Joseph Smith translation that he is praying to the Father, you know, wow, are, are we going to... We, he's sad. Nobody's believing him. He's got all this opposition. And he's like, Father, is there another way? And he's praying. And, and the Father, it says that in that it's like... A lot of people think it's a clap of thunder, and and then all of a sudden God tells him, "I have glorified thee, and I will glorify thee again." It's beautiful. Means I will be with you. I we can do this, and and it's uh, hey ya, yeah. hey, yeah. <laughs> I am. Yeah, exactly. Let's do this. Uh, that's kind of my new battle cry in the morning. When, <laughs> exactly. when I'm feeling that works for when, that moment there. <laughs> when I'm feeling just a need to let uh, that lift. I am. We can do this. Okay, moving along. Uh, when we go to Lorenzo Snow, famous quote that actually came from Joseph in the King Follett discourse, but well, actually, he got it first. Brigham told him not to say anything until Joseph said it yeah, first, exactly. and then Joseph said it in the anyway, King Follett discourse. I love the quote. Sometimes in different words. Uh, yeah, it's just different words that Joseph said, but it's the same concept. As man is, God once was. And as God as man may become, that concept is so revolutionary that we really can become like him. What a concept. Now let's just jump to Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. Okay, if we're a child, that means we can become, if, if, I'm, if I'm a boy child, I can become a father. And if I'm a girl child, I can become a mother. So, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, 
Meaning if we're the children of God, then we become joint heirs with Christ and become like God. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Romans 8, 17. So he's basically saying, you know, we really are the children of God. And we really can grow up to be like him. We just got to choose in. Now, some people would say, well, that's not blasphemous, just like they did to Christ. You know, um, well, next verse almost puts it right there in John 5, 18. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath in their opinion, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So this whole concept that we're like the sons and daughters of God is the revolutionary concept that the Christian world don't want to accept because they, they, they want to have God so far from us that he's unreachable and that's what Joseph Smith really, the restoration kind of set on its head, that we are to become like him. When he said, come follow me, he wasn't joking. This is the real thing. We should come follow him. And just, you got any doubts what Joseph thought about it? I got these quotes from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Oh, good. <laughs> anyway. I, I like it when we don't just say that he said it, but we The just mind show it. or the intelligence which man possesses is co-equal with God himself. Whoa, really? That's pretty powerful. So, you know, and yet it's not a boastful thing because you could rephrase that and say, no, this is me putting a little exchange in there. The mind and intelligence a man possesses is co-equal with Satan. You could say that too, because it's just a matter of a choice of up or down. That is the position we find ourselves in. And if you are born to be God, you could also be born to be a devil. It's a matter of choice, not a pleasant thought. So don't take upon yourself the spirit of pride. That is not what we're talking about here. We're not exalting ourselves. We're being obedient to the Father and to Christ. And we're choosing in, not out, not rebellion. I know that my testimony is true. So he's not just poking this out. He's now putting his testimony on it. Hence, when I talk of these mourners, this is actually in a funeral. He's given this discourse. I think it is King Paul. Yeah, this is the King Paul <clears throat> discourse. What have they lost? Their relatives and their friends are only separated from their bodies for a short season. Their spirit, which existed with God, have left the tabernacle of clay only for a little moment as it were, and now they exist in the place where the converse together at the same as we do on earth. Next, going on, I am dwelling on the immortality of the spirit of man. Is it logical to say that the intelligence of the spirit is immortal? These are questions. And yet, that it had the beginning? He's questioning that concept, did it have a beginning? And then he's answering the question right here. The intelligence of the spirit had not beginning neither will it have an end that is good logic that which is has a beginning may have an end there never was a time when there was not spirits for they are co-equal parentheses co-eternal with our father in heaven that is pretty powerful stuff that not only says that christ or jehovah um, said i am but that you realize that you exist. You know, that's a basic truth. Do you exist? When you look into the depths of your own mind, I, are you an I am? I, are you the beginning? I like to, to think that I have a little piece of I am in me. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're already there. Because the whole point of this whole probationary period and the previous existence that only Mormons, we, we, we offended some of our Christian friends when we said the pre-existence, or, you know, um, they're like, there is no pre-existence. Well, I'd like to say that if there was no pre-existence, then God is not a just God. Because we don't come into this life equal. All you got to do is look around the world and you realize some come in at different levels. And if we do not believe that we're going to go out of this world 
and obtain to different levels based on merit, on justice, and mercy, then we don't believe in the mormonism that Joseph restored. So if you look at the pre-existence, as we call it, if you don't believe that the position we came into this world was based a little bit on merit, then you don't believe in a just God. You believe that he's capricious, like, like Islam does. That he just randomly picks this guy to this position and this guy to this position. Because he was in a good mood when he yeah, got out he's of in bed a, this He's morning. in a good mood for this guy, <laughs> and he just didn't like your personality, you know, uh, or whatever the case is. I don't believe in that God. I believe in a just and honest and not a respecter of persons. I believe in a God that is a respecter of choice and that he's a just God who, based on covenant, I love the way you put it, gives us choice in a way that merits what our future looks like. And so the pre-existence merited somewhat where we are now. So if the, it were not so, then why was Israel separate? Exactly. Which That's what I was just going to say. I was just going to say, if, if, if it's not based on something that has merit, if it's not legal, if it doesn't have a unilateral application, then... God would have been playing, well, why did he save Israel instead of the Egyptians? You know, he would have been playing favorites with people, whereas he makes it very clear that he is there to rescue Israel and because of the covenant that was made with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, mm-hmm. and Jacob. And by that, <clears throat> by the terms of that covenant, it is legal for him to step in and rescue them. And I love it because it is really by covenant that he, we give him permission to intervene in our lives it's by a, choice, by covenant, by deal. ordinance. It's a pretty good deal. I accept it and he takes care of it. Yeah. And, 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 and I, want, I think it would be illogical to think God. that that didn't happen in the preexistence, like I said, or else God would be capricious because anyone can see we're not born equally into this world. Some people are born to different positions all over the place. But we all have equal opportunity to choose. And we all were created equal. There's diff- there's difference. Choice makes the difference. What you choose. If you take on yourself a victim mentality and choose to be a victim and not... I won't say that because many of us get victimhood, but we have to choose out. We have to choose responsibility to move forward. And I realize that might be offensive to some, especially if they have a victim mentality. (laughs) I don't mean to be offensive. I'm just telling you, you have the power between you and Christ to change who you are. That when Joseph of Egypt was taken into prison for, for 14 years for something he didn't do, he made the best of it. He made, yeah, he made choice. lemonade out of the lemons. And he, he didn't, he made a choice to responsibility. And that's what I'm suggesting. When you're dealt lemons, make lemonade, like she said. I think it's beautiful. I need to move on or we're going to, or we're going to bog down too much and we're still going to be too long. And it came to pass that Jesus had said the words he perceived that there were some among them who marveled and wondered what he would do concerning the law of Moses. For they understood not the saying that the things of old had passed away and that all things had become new. And that's kind of an interesting concept, first fruits concept. And he said unto them, marvel not that I said unto you the old things had passed away and that all things have become new. Behold, I say unto you that the law is fulfilled that was given unto Moses. Now understand, that doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. That means the observances, the the the, the patterns that help them remember. And the patterns. Well, and, and it meant those parts of that the law that were fulfilled. He's going to go on to say in every part that isn't fulfilled yet is still fulfill. going to be fulfilled. And right? one of those is the Ten Commandments. They're just basic, solid things that we should be living and then he goes on to say behold i am he that gave the law and i am he who covenanted with the people of israel therefore the law is fulfilled and i have come to fulfill the law therefore it have an end in me so he's basically saying i'm i'm the guy that that helped put this all together so now let's just jump to the hebrew word israel 
Yod Sheen Resh Aleph Lamed. Okay, that is the word for Israel. God prevails. That's the definition that Blue Letter Bible puts on it. Um, I like the description that it's the work set apart of the Son with the Father's authority. So Israel, you have to look at this same concept. When when a, a, a I'm first thing that popped in my head when a bishop is set apart as a bishop, he's set apart for a different job to do. He's set apart to accomplish a different thing than the normal ward member. Does that make him better than or less than? Well, neither, really. <laughs> it usually kind of pushes it one way or the other. <laughs> it does on put him does. In, a, in a place of decision. But my point is, he is set apart. And that's what Israel was done in this earth. Israel was set apart. And many people would call that biased. Why in the world was Israel given that? Well, it's covenant. Israel was set apart because of covenant. It was made different because they agreed to different. <laughs> get used to different. Uh, anyway, they 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 chose to be God's people, especially at Sinai. You know, they they made that choice, and Jacob was named for his people, Israel, when his name was changed to Israel. It's the authority of the Father through the Son to perform a set apart work, and and I could go through the description there, but in essence, it's the work set apart by the head of authority. And that's what Israel's job was. And most of the time, true to form, when anybody, it's DNC section 121, anybody gets a little authority as they suppose, they immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. That's the mistake of getting a job. Don't think it makes you better than. It makes you a servant, as Christ said. So the word Israel is, the the. Yeah, is the Yod. Yisrael, or Israel, is Israel, basically... Israel. Israel is not much different in pronunciation. Now, I'm jumping back to Moses for a minute, drawing from the water and being a type of the Red Sea on the seventh day because I want to just hit real quick another future mission I see Moses in, or we see Moses in, just so that you can see, and we're going to give you why. When, when you look at our Daniel's numbers chart, you realize that we place Moses as one of the two witnesses. And you ask yourself, well, why in the world do you place Moses there? Well, because of Scripture. We don't usually make decisions that we don't back up in Scripture. Now, if we happen to be well, wrong. we try not to. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's probably a better way to say it. We try not to. But I'm not going to make this choice for you. I'm just going to pre- present the evidence as we see it. Yet Michael, the archangel, was when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. This is in Jude in the New Testament. Durst not bring a railing accusation. But said, Lord rebuke you. In other words, Satan come to Michael, and Jude's reporting on it, and said, where's the body of Moses? Satan couldn't find his bones, so to speak. It is by that that we believe that when Moses went away and it said the Lord buried him, that was figurative from that perspective. But the truth is, he was translated, and he was translated for a work to come. That is our perception of these events, because... When you read, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. This is in Revelation, by the way, about the two prophets that stand in in ancient Israel. These are the olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If many, if any man hurt them, fire proceedeth forth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut the heavens that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now, that's basically something we're going to talk about more when we get to the life of Elijah, because Elijah fulfills that first portion. But this portion down in the red, and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood. There it is, just clear as can be that this... Who do you think of? Who do you think of? Who turned the waters to blood? And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, to me, that just did a perfect description right there in the content of Revelation of the two that filled the mission, Elijah and Moses. Moses being the one who turned the water to blood. He was translated based on the book of Jude when he went away and the Lord buried him. And Satan was contending, saying, well, I don't see where you buried him. I can't see where he died. Well, guess what? He probably didn't. 
Uh, that's my arm. <laughs> you know? I, and of course, they would both appear on the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's yeah. there's many many other reasons to to make that conjecture that it's Moses and Elijah, even though it's not stated directly in Scripture. But to me, one of the the most Im- impelling reasons to, is that when you think about that mission of the two servants in the last days and what they are to do. They are to save Israel. They're they're to protect the Temple Mount while they're being surrounded. And when I think of who would be, if you were to pick two people that loved Israel, it's beautiful more than more than any other next to Christ Himself. Yeah, it would be Moses. I want to push us because I want to know. Let me explain that: the Father of the Law and the the Father father of of the the prophets. Prophets. I know. I love it. I love it. That's Moses and Elijah. Okay, I want to go and show you that not only are Moses and Elijah going to be on stage, but Joseph told us many of those who have gone before, probably all of the majors who have gone before, are going to be on stage in one form or another. Be Looking at DNC 103, verses 16 through 20, Therefore I raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. This is talking in our day. For ye are the children of Israel and the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out of bondage by power. Do any of you feel a little in bondage right now? Like government's beginning to be more and more impressive. And with the outstretched arm, that's that's Moses, outstretched arm. That's definitely a type Actually, of Actually, we're talking about Exodus 6, verse 6. Right there, it's being quoted, and I'll bring it up in the next lesson on Passover. Okay. And as your fathers were led at first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be with power. Therefore, let not your hearts faint, for I say not unto you as I said unto your fathers, my angel shall go before you, but not my presence. Now, look at this next verse. Notice the singularity in my angel and in the next verse. But I say unto you, my angels shall go before you, and also my presence and in the time ye shall possess the goodly land. I am so glad you quoted that, that okay. verse. That's that so is just important. such a connector that says not only this time, it's my angels. Okay, let's go to teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith one more time. And in the interest of time, I'm going to start down at that second paragraph. Well, no, I'm not. I'm going to read it. You have to suffer it. Moses sought to bring the children of Israel to the presence of God through the power of the priesthood, but he could not. In the first ages of the world, they tried to establish the same thing. And there were Elias's right up who tried to restore these very glories. So he's defining Elias's right there as people who have tried to establish Zion. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, John the Moses, Baptist, yeah, all Joseph of them. Smith. Uh, Joseph Smith, all of these people. But they prophesied of a day when the glories would be revealed. Paul spoke of the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God would gather together all things in one, etc. And those men who have had keys, that's a lot of men. Those men who have had keys have been given will have to be there at Adam on Diamond, and without us cannot be made perfect. These men are in heaven, but their children on earth their bowels yearn over us. God sent down men for this reason. And the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, being these men, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that have given offense and them that do iniquity. Then this famous so this last line. Scene. Yeah, this is this is a, a, a well, a judgment, celestial judgment for sure. And all these authoritative characters will come down and join hand in hand in bringing about this work. That is a declaration that this is a grand closing symphony that we're about to see. That's beautiful. I say we. Hopefully we, because I don't think the unrighteous will see it. Very clear in Revelation. There's two different paths here. Now, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8. Behold, the day come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign over, or excuse me, a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. 
And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now that's pretty big. There's going to be an event in the future that's bigger than the Red Sea crossing. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, the ten tribes, and of all countries, the scattered remnant of Israel, whether they had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So we're at the end of my presentation. I'm going to give you one more one more slide afterwards to just lead into hers that you'll be in a separate presentation. Okay. I am that I am. This is the end of, of my session on the I am that I am, that you were born for this day. You were born for this purpose. You are here to help the greats wrap this thing up. That's really cool. You know, we were born for such a day as this. That being said, I just wanted, this will be Rhonda's next presentation. I'm going to go into the Hebrew definition of Passover. Pay. Shh. I can't Samach. do it. Samach. Cut. It's kind of a cut. I can't do that. I, I'll I try. You're swearing over it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so Passover. You turn in Hebrew into Klingon. It's not working. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, I could probably say it better if I tried to do it Klingon. Anyway, um, so Passover. That being said, its its basic meaning is um, mouth supporting the wall of protection. The, the, the shimmy is a support. It's like a support or protection and fences of protection. It's like the support of the fence. So it's it's to speak or, or to have the support of protection. That is the blood painted on the doors. And that is the, the supporting side. Now the negative side is the fence of protection from the destroyer. You know, that's, that's what I'm talking about. But the destroyer is what has to pass over. Um, and that's what we're looking to be a part of the good guy team. That's kind of simple. Anyway, I want to be on the great and glorious part of the great and terrible day. I want to be on the great side, not the terrible side. I hope you do too. I commission you. And this was fun. Anything? Last words? Uh, no. <laughs> Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel in the tenth day of the month. They shall take unto them a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for every house. And ye shall keep it till the fourteenth day of the same month, whose whole assembly of the congregation is. Israel shall kill it in the evening. There it is. Ron is going to describe that more in the future here. But just understand that the Passover is a type of Christ and a type of the end. So, this is the end of, of my presentation today. It's been great. We love you. I am that I am. God bless. End of episode 13. Thank you. We'll see you next time. <laughs>